Let's pray. Most gracious Father, we thank you so much um, for the honor and privilege of being able to worship you. And the songs this morning, um, filled with your truth, filled with promises we can hold on to. Father, as we go through the message this morning, um, I'd ask that you touch everybody's heart, that you bring those promises from the songs we sang just a few minutes ago back to mind. Because there's something in each one of those songs that actually is in the message this morning. Father, I ask that you just enlighten each person individually through your story. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my friend back in the back asked me what the title of this message was, and I said, oh, we're going to talk about faith today, and that's true. It's true. That's what we're actually talking about. But the title, if you had the title anything, it'd be, uh, we'd be talking about coming through storms in our lives, or trials. If you, if you prefer trials, say trials. But we're going to talk about storms, because that is the illustrations we have in Scripture right now. Okay? And you've all been around. We've got a lot of trials happening right now. In every category, in every family, it seems, um, no one's been left out. Um, even if it's not you directly, it's a close friend, which makes it you directly again, right? There's just no way around it. So this morning I want to talk about, we're going to talk about these storms and a couple examples we have in Scripture of what happens in these storms, okay? Let me get my notes out here. Shouldn't be too long, guys. All right, so we're talking about these storms. Now, these storms come in different fashions, okay? Sometimes they come like a squall. Everybody know what a squall is? If you ever been to the coast long enough, a squall hits you. It's a short, brief, violent storm that you're like, it was blue skies. It's kind of like Montana, actually. <laughs> blue skies and then snow. And you're like, what happened? Well, a squall is the same way. You'll have to be out fishing, be blue skies, nothing. Just a beautiful day, and all of a sudden, this storm comes in like nothing else, rocks your boat, wants to drown you, but then it's gone, and you're back to blue skies. And for the life of me, I've never been able to figure that. We lived down in the Caribbean for eight years, and I never could figure out how that could work, how it could just in and out and leave you right back where you were. I never could figure that out. Where it went and where it came from, I don't know. But a lot of the trials we have in our lives are the same way. They're violent, but they're brief. They just come in and out. They do damage. There's no denying they don't hurt. But thank God they're brief sometimes. Yes. <laughs> right? But then we have other storms in our lives. And they come in like a hurricane. And we all know what them are. We see them in the news. Dorian's like ripping everything up across the coast and Bahamas and leaves devastation in the path. And it takes forever to heal from it. It destroys everything it touches. So regardless of whether it's a squall, and we personally I prefer squalls, short and brief, let's be done with it. But we have hurricanes as well. And they come into our lives and they wreck everything. And they touch everybody equally. And they hurt everybody. And as a body here, a lot of the stuff we've been facing, or you've been facing before I got back, has affected everybody. Right? But God works all things for good for those who love him. Amen. That's a promise. If you say you love Jesus Christ, you love God, he's going to work whatever you're going through for good. You may not see it. You may not understand it. Like the last song, it's all going to be clear, no more questions at the end. It'll make sense when we get there. But right now it doesn't. Okay? But there's a purpose to it. And the purpose I can give you this morning, well, let's back up. I want to clarify this. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not, a non believer or a believer. These storms hit everybody's life equally. Okay? They do. As a believer, though, Jesus promised himself that it's going to be, we're going to have trials. Above and beyond, just because we're his disciples. All right? They're going to come. And if you want that reference, it's John 15, 18 through 20. Jesus says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me first. Or hate, well, maybe. Know that it has hated me beforehand. I'll just read it. It's easier. <laughs> it has hated me before it hated you. If, the, if you were of the world, remember, as a believer, you're no longer of the world. You're set apart. As um, Glenn said a couple weeks ago, that chosen race, chosen generation, you're something different now, a new creation. So, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Right? That means less trials. If you're not bucking the system, there's less trials. Okay? The world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. 
Remember the word that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they, if they, have, um, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Trials are going to come. Now for the unbeliever, their own lives bring on a lot of their trials. Sin brings on trials. Sins of other people bring on trials in our own lives. It affects us. And then you can have trials just because you're a disciple. Just because you're saying, I love Jesus in the world, and the world's going to come against you. And you have more trials. And it sounds scary, and it is scary. And some storms are hugely scary. And you don't know the outcome. But our main passage I want to give you this morning is James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Most people probably know this. I think Glenn spoke on, or said, mentioned it a week or two ago. It says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials... Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And this is what we're talking about. This is the verses I want you to hold on to and take through this week. This James chapter 1, 2 through 4. Faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result. There's an outcome there. These storms and these trials cause something to happen. Okay? So that you will be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's a promise. That's the outcome. Now, a lot of us, when we first come to Jesus, it's like, I, I can, me personally, it was a lifesaver. Right? Our faith, my faith was like a lifesaver. You know, you fall overboard and they throw you this little floaty thing and you're in the ocean and you're like, seriously? I see boats up there. It cost me one of them. That, when I first came to faith, that was my faith. That was how small it was. If I were to liken my faith to a boat, I didn't get a boat. I got a lifesaver. But I was saved. I was floating. I may have been wet, but I was still saved. Other people, you know, their faith, everybody's a portion to them a certain amount of faith when they start out on this journey. Some people might have got a boat. A little, maybe a life raft. One of those ones, nice ones you see in the movies with covered where the Rain, they can't get in, but they still get tossed in the waves, don't they? They get battered by the storm just as much. They may not get wet like poor me in the life ring, but they're still getting battered. Other people get a little bit bigger boat to start with, maybe a little bit bigger. Who knows where you start at? That's between you and God. But that's your faith level. And today, when we talk about faith, I want you to think of it like that, like a boat, okay? So we have this... Storms come into our faith, and they test and they build our faith up. Bringing us to what, as James says, a perfect, being perfect and complete, lacking nothing. But we have to go through these storms. These storms build that faith. They let you migrate from my little tiny lifesaver that I was given. And hey, I'm grateful. Don't get me wrong. I was grateful for being saved. But I had to go through some trials to where my faith grew. To where the storms didn't batter me as much. I went from that little lifesaver in the ocean to the life raft. Now I'm not wet anymore and I'm not floating where sharks are going to eat me. Upgrade, right? <laughs> That's a good thing. My faith grew. And then it grew again to a, maybe a ski boat or something. It grows. And your faith grows and your faith gets bigger. And the storms suddenly don't affect as much. You see how that works? The bigger boat you're in, the less the storms are going to hurt you. And as your faith grows, God willing, you get to like a mighty battleship that just weathers the storm. Yeah, the storms still come. You can't, get, you can't deny it. You can't get away from it. But your faith is strong enough to fight through that. Okay? That's the goal. That's when, when we're, we're talking about this um, being perfect and lacking nothing, we're talking about faith. Being perfect in our faith where we're Yes, the storms are going to come, but we can hold to the cross. We're not going to stray off. We're not going to falter. And it, I guarantee if all of us think back to sometimes, there's been some storms where we had questions. We're like, yeah, what's going on? Okay? Maybe even to the point of saying, have you denied me? Talking to God, not other people, right? We've all been there at some point. Not, I won't say all. Some people haven't, but I know I have. I've been through storms where I'm like, man, I have no idea. I am lost. 
but you hold on to that and you see God work through the storm and suddenly, cha-ching, bigger boat. Right? And you get through that. This morning we're going to take a look at two passages and we're going to take a look and learn from his disciples. Because they went through two storms. If you've read your Bible a couple times, you've found there's a couple storms in there. Right? And they all go together on this teaching of faith. All right, so if you turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 8, starting just verse 23 to, through 27. Everybody should know this. Every Sunday school kid knows these stories, right? But we often don't put them together as one growing thing, okay? <clears throat> so Matthew chapter 8. <clears throat> We're going to look at our, the disciples here and see what they went through. Starting at verses 22 through 33. Oh, I'm sorry, 23. Let me move on down. When he got into the boat, the disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with waves, but Jesus himself was asleep. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. He said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. The men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this, that even the winds and sea obey him? Now let's back that up a little bit. Who were most of his disciples? What were the professions before Jesus called them? Most of them. Not all of them. I mean, poor Matthew the tax collector. He might not have ever been on the water, so he could have been really scared. But fishermen typically know what storms are. They've been in it. But this one was different. It's terrified them. It terrified them. So obviously it was a bad storm. We find Jesus asleep in the, in the boat, totally relaxed. I'm not sure how. It says waves are coming over it. Probably getting wet. I don't know how you sleep with that. But he was calm, relaxed. He had perfect faith. He knew God was watching over it. He knew everything was great. There's no problems. But the disciples worried. They freaked out. They had no idea. They're, they understood a little of who Jesus was, but they didn't understand completely yet. Okay? This was a faith-growing moment. Jesus rebukes them, says, You little, you have men of little faith. Alright? If you were if you were to bounce over to Mark and read Mark's account, Mark records them as actually accusing Jesus of not even caring for them. <laughs> if you don't believe it, go read it. Mark's, Mark's account says, you don't even care for us. You don't care that we're perishing. Harsh words. Harsh thoughts. But see, their faith was in a spot of growth. And through that, what they see is Jesus doing this remarkable thing that he stands up, rebukes the wind and the sea, and suddenly it calms down, and they're like, whoa. What kind of man is that? That even the wind and seas obey him. See, they were just getting a new insight to who God was and his power and what they could do, what he could do in their lives. The power that he could manifest in their lives. Okay? And their faith grew right there. Their faith grew right there, just a little bit. Yeah. Each one is a little bit different. Every one of our walks is different. And how storms affect us and how uh, God moves in our lives is different. Each one of us has a different story, a different testimony. And each one grows us differently. Each one of the disciples grew differently. And we'll see that in the next storm. Okay? Um... If we turn over just a few chapters to Matthew 14, we have our next one. Matthew 14, 22 uh, through 33. So they just got done. I mean, if you were to read through all this stuff there, you're seeing miracles. You're seeing all sorts of parables and teachings and all this stuff happening. Jesus is doing some stuff. The disciples are witnessing it, all of this. They're right there in it. Walking with him. Witnessing the man himself. Do all of it. And you've got to figure the faith's growing a little bit. It has to. Okay? But they get to this next storm. All right? It says, uh, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him. Right? Remember last time, Jesus got in the boat first. And the disciples got in with him. They followed him in. This time he commands them, hey, you go ahead. I got you. You go ahead. And they're like, cool. You got us through the last one? We'll walk on out. So they get in the boat. Immediately, he made his disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. 
while he sent the crowds away. Right? He's just feeding the 5,000. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, 3 to 6 a.m., late or early, depending on how you look at life, <laughs> uh, he came walking to them on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. And immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and, began, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took a hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You certainly, you are certainly God's son. Remember the last storm, what kind of man is this? A few days later, or however long later, you're certainly God's son now. <clears throat> See, they weren't afraid of the storm or anything else, but local superstition of ghosts got to them. It was a different test. It wasn't a stormy test. It was a test of this ghost superstition, what they grew up hearing. In Belize, they use ghosts and demons to scare the kids to discipline them. If you don't do this, this demon thing will come get you. Right? Superstition. It's a different kind of storm, but it still is a storm. It's still a trial that they had to grow through. Immediately, Jesus announced himself. Nope, it's me. Don't worry. And they were calm. And Peter's like, well, if it's you, let me come to you. Peter's faith has gone leaps and bounds here. He doesn't want to just stay in the boat. He wants to walk on the water. He wants to walk with the Lord. Wherever he's at, he doesn't care. You're walking on water. You want to walk in lava? I'm with you. Peter don't care anymore. He's just, I'm with you. Tell me to come on there. His faith is growing leaps and bounds. All right? Jesus says, come. But the, what I want you to keep an eye on, even though Peter's faith was growing, as soon as he took his eyes off of what happened, no, he began to sink. It says he was beginning to sink. He didn't just go, Poof. anybody ever go jump off a dock and just begin to sink? <laughs> <laughs> that ever work out for you? Or you just like slowly hit and like slide in like a cartoon? No, no. But scripture records it as he was beginning to sink. Meaning his faith wasn't gone, wavering, possibly. But it was still alive and active to the point he knew exactly who to call out to to save him. Amen. Right? His faith hadn't abandoned, he hadn't abandoned the faith. It was beginning to waver. But he called out to the Lord and guess what happens then? Immediately, it says, immediately, Jesus is standing right there and pulls him out of the water. Obviously, if he had to walk to him, there had to be some distance there. And Peter didn't make it very far. But Jesus covered the rest of the distance and met him there where he needed him. Where his faith faltered, Jesus met him there as soon as he called out to him. Now, when you're in those storms, are you calling out to him? Because he'll meet you right where you're at. He's not going to falter. He's not going to wait and say, well, it's tea time. <laughs> Be there at 30. No. Scripture says immediately he was there. And he reached up and pulled him back up. And then they walked back to the boat. Together. Now, isn't that a beautiful, sight, a beautiful picture there when you think about it? Walking out, beginning to sing, calls on Jesus. Right there, Jesus pulls him out of the water, and he leads him back to safety. He'll do the same thing for you. But you have to call him. Better yet, don't take your eyes off him, and he won't begin to sing. That's a little bit harder. That's a bigger pill to swallow. I mean, obviously, we all have different problems in our lives. But ideally, the goal would be never to take your eyes off the cross. Never falter. That's the goal for each one of us. That's the goal. Hard, yes. Will we falter? Guaranteed. 
But even when we do, you still call him. And he'll be right there where you were. Wherever you were, wherever you started to falter, he'll be there. That's what we see in these two stories. We see a growth of faith. Okay? We see a growth. Um, <clears throat> I have no idea where my eyes are notes. I guess it doesn't matter. Hmm? It doesn't matter. So we go from, their faith was, what kind of man is this? They get over here to this next trial. We have, well, you're certainly God's son. Okay? Their faith, like we talked about earlier, may have started out as a little life raft. Some of them, maybe like for me and a little lifesaver. And I'm a huge guy, so that lifesaver is like just an arm thingy. <laughs> holding on for dear life. But their faith grew. And as you see it in the stories here, between both stories, you see it grow a lot for Peter. And yes, he did, he's faltered, and he began to sink. Read it carefully. It says, and beginning to sink, some words began to sink. It wasn't like underwater. Like, I know, I jump off the dock, I go to the bottom. And then I fight to come back up. He began to sink, okay? And then Jesus was right there through that storm. He was right there in the beginning of the storm, wherever you're at in your faith. And these trials, what we're talking about today, is the trials that the church is going through here as a whole. The church in the valley, I mean the universal church, all of our churches are under attack. We prayed about it. I was at a prayer meeting a couple weeks ago. We were praying about it. Right? Our families are under attack. Marriages are under attack. Our children are back in school. They're under attack. I guarantee you, if you don't believe they're being under attack at a public school, you've lost your mind. Because you can't even talk about Jesus there without being persecuted. We're being attacked and there's storms and trials everywhere. But through that, there is joy. James told us at the beginning, count it pure joy. Why? Because the goal is growing. The goal is that we'd be perfect, lacking nothing. That we'd be a better witness for Jesus wherever we're at. Why? Because we can testify as to what he's done in our lives. Because each one of us has a different story. Each one of us has been through different storms. We've seen God work in different ways in our lives or in our friends' lives. And we can testify to that and we can praise God for that and we give glory to him by sharing that with others, encouraging others. Instead of forsaking people who need help, we can rally around them and say, you know what? God brought me through this. Some of us, we can talk, hey, you're going through the same thing I've done. And God brought me through that and we can share that. We can encourage people. And we need to do that. We need to circle the wagons. <clears throat> now Peter, we'll go back to Peter here. Yeah, Peter. Good old Peter. I love Peter. If you were to read just a little bit further, we have this first story. What kind of man is this? Matthew 8, 27. You are certainly God's son. That's a big upgrade from... Man to God's son, that's a huge upgrade. You find that in Matthew 14, 13. Peter, in just two more chapters, says you are the Christ, the son of the living God. His faith has grown to the point of actually recognizing who Jesus is in his entirety. And Jesus says, you know what, the only way you could know that is if God himself revealed that to you. But that, his faith had to grow to that point. He was stepping out of that boat. Maybe faltering, yes. And we know if you keep reading on, he faltered pretty big time later on. Again. But then he's lifted back up. Just because the storms come against you doesn't mean you have to fall. Cling to the cross. Cling to Jesus through it all. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Like James says, I want, I'll sit read it one more time. I want you guys to remember this verse if you don't know it. Especially you younglings. Consider it all joy. And yes, I know, the storms don't feel joyful. They hurt and they're painful. But if you look to the future, if you look to what God actually is planning, He wants to grow you. Whether it's a storm because of somebody else, whether it's a storm because of sin you welcomed in, you've done something, and now you're reaping the consequences of the something, yeah, that happens. But you can repent of that and come through that, and God can work through that. If it's somebody else's sin that they did something and now it's affecting you, God can get you through that too. 
If it's trials and storms just because you're standing up for him. God bless you. Those are probably going to be the worst storms you could face. Because now you've done nothing wrong and you're going to have way more questions. Because all you're doing is standing up for what's good and righteous and holy. And the world's coming against you. Which is a good thing. Honestly. Consider all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance. Just like going to a gym and working out and working out, you get stronger. You're able to do more and go longer. Withstand the storms. And let endurance have its perfect result. So that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And we're talking about faith here. We're talking about the storms we're facing as a body in our personal lives, as the universal church up and down the valley. We need to rally together on these storms and encourage each other, lift each other up. Because God works through his people. He works through his people. Consider it joy. In closing today, I'm going to ask you to do two things. I, I always, anytime I've ever preached, I always ask people to do something. I give them homework. It's not very nice because I always hated homework as a kid. <laughs> now I'm on the other end of it, so it's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, that's wrong, but it's funny. Yeah. So <laughs> it's funny. Two things I want you to do this week. First, I want you to value, evaluate your faith. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is I want you to go back through your life, think about when you first came to Jesus, that faith there, and think about some of the trials you've been through. Remember what he's already brought you through. What he's delivered you from. The growth and faith that you have because of it. And then I want you to stop and pray and thank God for it. Be thankful for it, because he brought you on. Praise him for it. Because by remembering what he's already done, the storms you're facing now won't be so bad because it'll build your faith a little bit more, because you'll remember, because we forget. We're a forgetful people. We forget all the good things he's done, and we remember every bad thing that's ever hit us. Every bad thing you can count. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good things, half a one, you know. We were, we're for horrible, forgetful people, and ungrateful. So evaluate your faith, your walk. Remember those things that, yes, it's going to hurt remembering some of those storms, but count it joy. Because it grew your faith. It brought you further in your walk. Okay? That's the first thing. Secondly, this is going to be the harder one. Find somebody to share that with. Share what God has done in your life. And you don't have to go into huge, intimate, personal details. But you can share what God has done. His faithfulness. Through whatever trial you've been through. You can share it with somebody else. And that in itself will do two things. It will glorify God. Because now you're witnessing to God's greatness. And his goodness. And his faithfulness. And his loving kindness towards you. Second, you don't know. It could be encouraging somebody else who's faltered. Who's beginning to sink. Who needs to hear the encouragement that God is faithful. He hasn't abandoned them. So evaluate your faith. And then reach out and share it with somebody else. Glorify God in doing so. Show people what he's done. Be a witness. It's what he's called to do. Amen? Amen. See?